Hey there, people of victory. Good morning. How are you today? All right. Welcome online and welcome in person. We're excited to be together to worship the Lord. And as we begin our service today, just want to uh, roll out a couple of announcements. And the first thing is we always remind folks, hey, stay connected with us. Um, there are several ways that we can stay connected, both through social media and, and um, of course, there's old-fashioned old fashioned texting, and, um, <laughs> and, and there's also um, uh, our newsletter that comes out. So social media, Victory Anaheim, Atlanto David, sign up for our weekly newsletter at info at victoryanaheim.org, and we'll send you just a weekly update of what's going on. We usually give a few announcements here, but uh, in the, in the uh, newsletter, we'll give you more information about what's happening. Also, a couple of dates coming up that, that we want you to, to put on your calendar. And the first is that we have an upcoming serve day. And so that serve day is April 24th, Saturday morning. It's 8 o'clock in the morning. You need to RSVP for this. All right, so we're, we're doing this monthly serve day. It's a drive-up food distribution. It's in partnership with Love Anaheim. So I need to ask you to do something we need to get good at doing this. I, I've talked with the, the folks over at Love Anaheim, and they've asked our church to get a little bit better at this. We need to go to the Love Anaheim site, the loveanaheim.org. Go to their website, and you need to create a profile for yourself to be an ongoing volunteer. It's a one-time thing that you create a profile for yourself so they have you on record as a volunteer. And then, after that, you can go onto their site and any of their, their serving opportunities, you can, you can automatically sign. Yep, I'm in for that one. So you need to do two things. If you haven't signed up or if you, have, if you haven't created a profile, go create a profile at loveanaheim.org. And then secondly, go for this particular serve day over at La Palma Park on the 24th. Get, put yourself in there that I'm going. I'm in for that. So uh, we ask you to join us. It's going to be a great time. This will be our third uh, food distribution with Love Anaheim. Secondly, there's an upcoming team night, which is April 28th. Team night is for our volunteers. If you volunteer at Victory in any way, shape, or form, we ask you to come to team night. It's once a month, and uh, we, we've begun, this is going to be our second one, and uh, we had a great team night uh, last month. It was a beautiful time just before Easter. And we just want to invite our volunteers. If you volunteer in any way, shape, or form, or if you want to volunteer at Victory, come to team night. That's the place to get involved. That's the place to get to know people. That's the place to get plugged into serving at Victory. Wednesday, the 28th of April, and that's going to be at our church office, which is on the facility of First Christian Church of Anaheim. Now join me Jump in on your feet and let's get ready to worship the Lord. Your mercy and do it forever. Oh, Lord, you are good. 
Lord, you are good and your mercy endure it forever. Sing it out, church. People from every nation and tongue, from generation to generation, we worship you. Celebrated the risen Lord. Let's celebrate the risen Lord. Did you feel? Did you feel the mountains tremble? Did you hear the oceans roar? When the people rose to sing of Jesus Christ, the risen one. Did you feel the people tremble? Did you hear the singers roar? When the lost began to sing of Jesus Christ, the risen
heavenly gates prepare the way of the risen Lord. It's a time we just take in our in our service just to go to the Lord with our giving. Go ahead and take your seats. big part of the Christian life is about response. Response. And I think of, of uh, it reminds me of parenting. Because especially when my children were young, they would say, they, they talk about me now and they go, Dad, when we were little, you were so, like, you would get so angry and you would get so worked up and you would get so, and I say, well, it all depended on your response. If you would respond to me well, you wouldn't get anger. You wouldn't get aggressiveness. If you would respond well, you got calm. I, you, you got me worked up. I gave you what I thought you needed in that moment. And the Christian life is about response to God. And, and, and sometimes some of us are so stubborn and, 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 and we, we, we live out in a stubborn way in regards to God. We know what's right, but we go our own way or some other way. And in the Christian life, when you respond to God, it's, it, the way you respond, it says everything about your trust in God. And, um, and so I, as um, a response to God's love, we give generosity. Generously. We practice generosity. In response to God's giving to us, we give back to Him. And so in our church, we practice the tithe and, and we give 10% back to the Lord. And so we want to encourage you to be part of what God's doing through our church and what God's doing in our community and in our world through victory. And you can give a couple of different ways. For you in person, we have our offering box in the back. And then for you online, or for you in person if you want to give online as well, uh, our, our website, victoryanaheim.org slash donate, you can use that for your uh, regular giving, either one time or regular giving. You can set it up. So God bless you as you give. What you said about response is huge, and it's actually something I was going to talk a little bit about. How many of you guys can relate to a time where things didn't go your way, things didn't go as you planned? Maybe you have a conflict with someone, maybe you disagree with someone, and you shut down. And your response isn't good, and you're in emotion. Well, that happened to me last Friday. And you know, hearing the word and reading the Bible, doing all the good things, going to church, are beautiful. But if it doesn't translate into you living it, what good is it? So to spare you all the details, last Friday, stuff happened, layers of disappointment happened in a row, and it brought some feeling of emotion to myself, and disappointment, sadness, a little bit of anger. Anyway, we get to a restaurant to celebrate my son's birthday, and I come to the table, and I'm not in a good state of mind. And I didn't want to pretend that everything was okay. And I really wanted to rejoice and celebrate my son. But in the headspace I was in, mm -mm, it wasn't good. So I got up and I went to the bathroom and I prayed. And I prayed, Lord, and I confessed what I was feeling. I confessed I didn't like these, this emotion because this, I was letting this emotion control my choices and my actions. And I prayed. And I wanted him to fix me like that. <laughs> and it didn't happen but I still submitted and I trusted and I thought gosh I can't stay in this bathroom all night I'm gonna have to go back to the table so I walked back to the table and I sat down and I tell you guys this I just say it was a supernatural God thing where the first words that came out of my mouth were really sincere and joy and it was a God thing and I can remember earlier in the week, I was listening to the radio, and they said, God is never too early, he's never too late, but he's always right on time. <laughs> and 
I can attest to that. God is always right on time, but it takes us to submit. It takes us to make room for the Holy Spirit to work, and it takes us to respond and follow and obey the ways of Jesus. This song, Open the Eyes of My Heart, Lord, is just about that. Pastor's going to speak to us, and the, the next series is an openness to God. Are you feeling open-hearted right now? Are you, are you bitter? Did you get off on the wrong side of the bed? Did stuff happen and you're upset? Did you get into a conflict? Well, you know what? Release that right now. Lord Jesus, we ask you to help us to release any emotions of anger, of bitterness, of frustration, of disappointment, Lord, because right now we want to worship you. Right now we want to set our hearts and our minds on you. So, Lord, we ask you to open the eyes of our hearts.
Hello to God's people. Welcome to Victory. We're excited to be together as the people of God. Today we start a new series, and this series is called Open. Open. It's a 10-week series exploring three, or excuse me, six themes. No. It's a 10-week series exploring 10 themes over the next several weeks about being the best version of yourself to be who God needs you to be in a world full of need. And so today I'm going to bring a message called Open Hearts. Open Hearts. This series, just as American society is opening, we're asking questions like, how should we live as God's people? How are God's people different from people of the world? How can we pursue a kingdom agenda in the world? And so in this series, we're going to answer those questions and see what the Bible teaches us about being the right kind of people. Someone once told me the best advice for someone aspiring to get married is never to look for the right person. It's always to be the right person first. Be the right person. Don't look for the right person. If you are the right person, the right person will emerge in God's time. And so I want to I wanna, I wanna, um, t- go way back in the day right now and tell you a story about, about me when I was in college. So I was in college... Back in the last century, in 1993, and I was in Bible college. I went to Baptist Bible College in Springfield, Missouri, and Marcia and I had just gotten married right before I started in Bible college, and I started the semester the, in the spring semester instead of the the uh, fall semester, and and so uh, we were. I was working at, at, at a, a little yogurt place called the Country's yes, Best Yogurt. And uh, I was working there, and the, the, the owner of the place goes, you know what, Dave, I think I can make you the manager. I need to train you up. You need to learn how to do yogurt, though. And, you know, everything about the job was, was very, it's like your first, you know, your first job is always very, just, man, very controlled, and you have to do it exactly this way exactly what they say and your breaks are really short and everything's on the clock and and I remember when 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 they're teaching me about about pouring yogurt to people and each each uh, serving of yogurt had to be weighed out to specification and if you were over then you can't serve them that yogurt you're giving them too much so then you put it back in the thing and you start over and it's got to be exactly right and when there's a big line of people and then you you're, you know, I, what was happening to me is okay this is supposed to be five ounces of yogurt and it would be like 5.25 and that's too much so you got to pour that back and then do it again and you're like oh that's 4.97 okay oh went over too much you're like that's too much and so I didn't, I, I, I never did well at that job. I'm like, you know what? This is too restrictive for me. I'm, I'm, I'm not doing this. So I didn't last at that job. But wasn't making much money. And 
Uh, Marcia and I, we lived on campus at the Bible College. Thank God, Bible colleges, our Bible College was really inexpensive, and we lived on campus, which saved us a lot of money. Um, but but um, one day, God was going to teach me something about having an open heart. And I, we were part of a church called Park Crest Baptist Church in Springfield, Missouri. And uh, I was part of a men's group that we met on Saturday mornings, early Saturday mornings, We'd get together, men's group. Again, I was this newly married guy in Bible college. Did not earn much money. Part of a good church. And at that men's meeting that morning, there was one of the guys, one of the guys that was, was sharing his heart. He just opened up his heart and, he, and he's going, man, we are struggling. I lost my job. We're not making it. And um, I don't know what we're going to do. We've got these you know, Bill's coming up that I just don't know what we're going to do. And, and, and um, I, I'm the kind of person that sometimes I, 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 I'm so open, I'm so trusting, I'm so uh, ready to follow God. I'll say it like that. I'm ready to follow God. Like, I used to think, I'm, I wonder if I would do something. When I, when, when I grow up, will I, like, live on the, you know, like, in, in do something like, um, ministry to the poor, like Mother Teresa in, in Calcutta or something like that. Like I sort of envisioned myself doing that for my life. Like material possessions meant little to me. The kind of clothes you wear, the kind of driving the right car had never meant anything to me. Nothing. I've never been impressed by seeing the kind of clothes that people wear. I've never been impressed by where people live. I've never been impressed by who people know. It just wasn't a thing with me. Never has been. And, and so, um, but I don't know if Marcia knew that she was marrying that kind of guy when she married me. And, 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 and sometimes we've been te- we were tested in our relationship because of that. And in that men's group meeting, I had our rent money with me, and I gave our rent money to this guy in need. I had our rent money with me, and I, and I, and I was like, you know what? I, I think I need to give this man our rent money today. I don't know how I'm going to pay our rent, but I think that, you know, God's calling on me to do this, and, and I'm going to do this. And I was the poorest guy in the room. I was the, 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 the guy in Bible college among people who are, you know, grown-ups and, and, and um, you know, have their lives and kids and houses and blah, blah, blah. And, and I was like, you know what? I think that God wants me to do this. And so I did it. And then I showed up and t- tell Marcia, like, um, we're going to have to trust God here because... I just gave away our rent money, and um, <laughs> it was not an us decision. It was a me decision, but you know what? By God's grace, some kind of miracle, she's still with me. She's still with me, um, and, um, but in all honesty, I had an open heart to God, and I believe that's what I needed to do, and God provided our rent. God provided our rent. He just did it in a, in a, in, in a way that God does. And we need to have open hearts when we go to God. And, and so what, what I want to do is I want to tell you a story about, about a woman from the scriptures. Her name was Lydia. And Lydia's story is so cool. Her story is so cool. And I want to share this with you. This is from the book of Acts chapter 16. I'm going to read some verses from Acts chapter 16. If you'll follow along with me, I'm going to read verses 11 through 15 from Acts chapter 15. And, and it, says, it says, starting in verse 11, so... Setting sail from Troas, we made a direct voyage to Samothrace. Samothrace. And the following day to Neapolis. And from there to Philippi, which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. That would be something back in that day. Oh, it's a Roman colony. Oh, that's a cool city, a good city, a solid city. We remained in this city some days. And on the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate to the riverside, where we supposed there was a place of prayer. And we sat down and spoke to the women who had come together. One who, had, one who heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple goods, who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what Paul was said by Paul. And after she was baptized, 
and her household as well. And she urged us saying, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And she prevailed on us. Will you join me in prayer as I begin this message? Lord, I pray that you would use this message to your glory. I pray that this story about Lydia, you would use it to speak to our hearts about having an open heart like Lydia, about being ready to respond to you like Lydia. I pray that you bless this message and bless every hearer in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, so... So um, the first word in this, in this, in this passage, in, in verse 11, it said so. And I just want to point out that it's saying so because of what happened before that. And you'll have to read that on your own in verses 1 through 10 because it in itself is pretty cool. It's a great story about an open heart as well, but I'll give you the gist of it. So this was Paul, the apostle, his second missionary journey. He, said, he took several missionary journeys that are recorded in the book of Acts. And this was his second missionary journey. And it, prior to this missionary journey, he had, he had, um, had this, his, this, this longing to go farther out, to keep taking the gospel farther to people. Like if the starting place was Jerusalem, then everywhere the gospel went out from there, like no one had heard about Jesus, the gospel and the resurrection outside of, you know, a limited sphere of influence. And so Paul kept going. These missionary journeys were about taking the good news of life with God farther and farther to more people and more people so others could respond to God and put their faith in Jesus. And Paul, in verses 1 through 10, you see the story, and he's gathering his companions. He took a team of four people. There was Paul, Silas, Timothy, and Luke. Luke is the writer of the book of Luke and also the writer of the book of Acts. Luke was a doctor, so he's very meticulous in what he wrote. He gives a lot of details, and it shows that he was a doctor, a physician in his writings. And so Luke wrote this. We have the, the, the really cool story about, about what's happening here in this scenario. Luke is actually there, and then he's writing about it. So it's a firsthand, a firsthand a written a, a, a description of what the events that happened. Now, this journey, Paul had said, Lord, where do I go? And then the Lord, it says specifically in verses 1 through 10 that the Lord would forbid him. Don't go there. Don't go there. Don't go there. Don't go there. And so every city, the Lord would, the, the Spirit would, 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 would give him some kind of utterance and leading and guidance, like not to go to that city. And then Paul had a dream. They were, it says they were waiting here in Troas. It says, so after all that, we're looking, where do we go? Where do we go? So we, we set sail to Troas because Paul had had this dream. It was a dream of this man from the region of Macedonia, which is modern day Greece. It, uh, this man in the district of Macedonia had, 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 had um, called out to Paul and said, Paul, will you come and help us in this dream? And Paul and his companions took that as a leading from the spirit that they should go to Macedonia. So they went to Macedonia, and, and, and Paul had, had a, a strategy. He always went to leading cities, and he went to the city of Philippi, which was named after King Philip. He conquered the city, and then he named it after himself. And so, so, um, so Philippi was a leading city in this region of Macedonia. And, and they went to Macedonia or to Philippi in Macedonia. And then Paul's strategy was always to begin when he's taking the gospel. He'd always begin by going to the synagogue, looking for the Jewish people to, to unpack the scriptures that they already knew and show them how Jesus is the fulfillment of all the Old Testament prophecies about the coming Messiah. And, but there was one problem when Paul showed up in Philippi. There was no synagogue. There weren't enough Jewish people to have a synagogue. So Paul goes, well, where are we going to go? That's been my strategy. So where am I going to, you know what? We're going to, like, we heard about this place over by the river where these women gather to pray. So let's go to those women. Let's, let, let's do that instead of the synagogue. So they go there and they start talking to these ladies over by the, the river. And one of the ladies is this woman, Lydia. And, and so I want to just... Um, Go to verse 14 and call this first section open to God. From verse 14, I'm going to read verse 14 again. It says, one who heard us 
was a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple goods who was a worshiper of God. And pay attention to this. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. What are some things we know about Lydia? She was from, from Thyatira. Thyatira was a city that was famous for manufacturing or creating purple dyes. She was a merchant who sold purple goods, goods that had been dyed purple. There was a demand for it. Only the wealthy would be buying such things. And, and she herself was a wealthy person. She was an entrepreneur. So she was also, Lydia was not Jewish. She was a God-fearing woman. She was one of the early well-known non-Jewish Christians. It says that the Lord opened her heart. Notice that, remember what I told you about how Paul got to Philippi, how Paul got to this place. He had been asking the Spirit, where should I go? Where should I go? Nope, don't go there. Nope, don't go there. Go there. When, when Paul and his companions were responsive to God, they went where the Spirit led them. And, and they went to Philippi, not by chance, but on purpose, led by the Holy Spirit. They sought out people who might be open to God. So they heard that there, was, there were these women who prayed near the river. So they went there. Paul, Silas, Timothy, and Luke were listening to the Spirit. Their hearts were open to God. Lydia prayed with these women because, her, because she had a spiritual need. She sought God. You know, every person has spiritual needs. Every person alive has spiritual needs. We will always seek to meet our spiritual needs. When we depart from God, we seek, seek to meet our spiritual needs in, in ways that are destructive. So, so everybody you know is seeking to fulfill their spiritual needs. But some, most, are not fulfilling their spiritual needs in productive ways. They're fulfilling them in ways that are destructive. They're fulfilling them in ways that are harmful to their lives and the lives of others. Well, so, so Lydia had this spiritual need and she, sought, she was, it said she was a God seeker and a God fearing woman. And so she knew that seeking God was the way she needed to go. So on this day, when Lydia spoke to Paul and he talked about Jesus, it was not an accident. It was not a chance meeting. The Holy Spirit had set it up. The Holy Spirit had prepared Lydia to meet Paul and prepared Paul and his companions to meet Lydia. Not an accident. And, and not at all. So, so, they, so, so she was ready to find Jesus and Paul was going where the Spirit directed him. I want you to listen to this. It says, the Lord opened the, Lydia's heart. When God opens your heart... It is a supernatural event. It is not with persuasive words that you overcome doubt. It is because you have a spiritual need that is being filled. The hunger of the open heart is for our spiritual and emotional needs to be met. Crossing the line of faith is the result of an open heart responding to the work of the Holy Spirit to meet needs. Do you get it? So, two barriers today that keep people from finding faith. Christians who refuse to go and people who believe they have all the answers. In both cases, the problem is a closed heart. In both places, the problem is a closed heart. Did you get that? The big problem keeping people from finding faith today, Christians who refuse to go, and people who think they have all the answers. Both cases, the problem is a closed heart. Christians, open your heart to God. Listen to the Spirit. Be guided by the Spirit. So Lydia, what did she, what did she do what did, uh, with her newfound faith? She became a follower of Jesus. Following Jesus is an intentional decision. It is not something that you do as an add-on to your already busy life. It's not, you already know how hard it is to change habits. You know how hard it is to change your bad habits. Um, it's hard to change your diet. 
It's hard to work out. It's hard to read the Bible. It's hard to quit smoking. It's hard to stop drinking. But, but say that with me. It's hard. But Jesus is not another thing that you add to your life. Jesus is, is not something, another like failed attempt at trying to clean up your life. Check this out. We need Jesus because we need acceptance and belonging. Jesus receives us and believes in us. He brings meaning to your life. Not only will Jesus walk with you through your troubles, he will help you change your life. He will guide your steps and help you overcome every barrier. Second part of this message, an evaluated life. In verse 15, we see, in verse 15, it says, And after she was baptized, and her household as well, she urged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And she prevailed on us. Now, an evaluated life. To evaluate is to assess, to appraise for value, to determine the significance. And, and so, so an evaluated life is a life that's open to be evaluated, to be appraised by whom? By God and others. And so part of the problem with Christianity that, 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 as the way many people live it is that they're not ready to be evaluated. We don't want anyone to appraise our lives and the value of our lives. And we say, it's not your business. Every time we say, it's not your business, to somebody who seeks our well-being in confronting our behavior, we're not responding to God. We're going the opposite way. And, and so, so to, to live out the full Christian experience, we open ourselves up for our lives to be evaluated and to be open to, for, for others to say, you know what, can I make a suggestion here of something that you need to improve? Can I give you something that might help you uh, increase uh, your effectiveness there? Lydia, I'm going to say this. First thing, she was, she, was, she was baptized. And look at this new, this new believer. It says that she was baptized. And as soon as she, she, like she got put her faith in Jesus, they were next to the river. And she was baptized right there. And it says not only her, but her household believed too. See, a bunch of open hearts, a bunch of open hearts to God, and they put their faith in Jesus, and they were baptized. And, and, and the meaning of baptism is a picture of the death and the resurrection. All right, remember this. Bat baptism is our statement to God, to ourselves, and to other believers that I am all in with Jesus. Amen. Anybody all in? Woo! Say it. I'm all in. all in. I give my life to you, Jesus. A picture of his death. Jesus died on the cross. I am dead to sin. I am dead to my old life. I am dead to shame. It has no power over me anymore in Christ. The, 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 the little voices that whisper to shame me, that's not of God. That's not of God. And, and, and so I'm dead to shame. I won't respond to the shame. I'm going to respond to God's goodness and forgiveness. Because Jesus in the resurrection, and baptism is also a picture of resurrection. On the third day, Jesus arose. I arise to new life in Christ. I arise to new habits. I arise to new desires. To a future filled with grace. To a future filled with love. To a future filled with forgiveness. I want you to hear this. Dead to sin, alive to Christ. That's what baptism is. As a side note, Lydia's whole family was baptized. And this is an amazing thing. It was like a little revival. When God's people are open, it unleashes spiritual power. That's how it works. When God's people have open hearts to him, it unleashes spiritual power. You want spiritual power unleashed into your life. Have an open heart to God. Don't have a closed heart to God. 
Lydia said, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, notice that Lydia invited Paul and the others to evaluate her life, and she had a request. But she put out her, her evaluation thing first. Like she, It was like, uh, in other words, Lydia was saying, she said, if you have judged me to be faithful, in other words, she's saying, if you, you've seen how I live my life, do you see me to be faithful to the Lord? If, if I'm not faithful, then forget what I'm about to ask. But if I am faithful, then please respond to my request. And, and that's exactly what she did. She opened her life to evaluation and, 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 and she invited them into her house. Come and stay at my house. Do you know that the church in Philippi, the church in that city, you have the book of Philippians in the Bible, the church at Philippi, do you know where they first met? In Lydia's house. Lydia's house was the first place where the church at Philippi met. Because she was open to God. She opened her household to God. And so um, there, there's a reality here that Christianity has to be fully applied or to be fully applied has to open up our lives to about evaluation. Don't be saying, hey, step off. I, you don't have any business. You know, it's, it's none of your business how I act. It's none of your business what I do. Keep your distance. Human beings have this deep emotional need to be known and to be loved. We have a deep emotional need to be known and to love. People will go to extremes to meet their emotional needs in terribly destructive ways. If you doubt what I'm saying, then consider gangs. Why do people join gangs? It's not because gangs offer a wonderful future. It's not because of the benefits that come along with being in the gang. People join gangs for survival and to belong. That's why they join gangs. Some of the signs that your emotional needs are not being met are if you need to impress other people to feel okay about yourself. If you need to impress in order for, to be okay with yourself, something is wrong emotionally. Your emotional needs are not being adequately met. That is an improper or destructive way to meet your emotional needs. It, it, an, another sign that your emotional needs are not being met, if you have strained relationships in your life. You have relationships that are strained. You used to be close, but they're strained. They're not close anymore. If you can see relationships that are strained in your life, then you're meeting your emotional needs in a destructive way. And, and, and how about this? If you're, another way, if you're defensive at the slightest criticism, your emotional needs are not being adequately met. I have had to wrestle with this one. Many times, I'm still working on it. I know I've got some work to do. Hiding behind your skills, fearing that they will discover the true you is another sign that your emotional needs are not adequately being met. Lacking the ability to trust God and to trust other people is a sure sign that your emotional needs are not being met. It's on you to pursue the meeting of your emotional needs. And it's by the way you live. It's by who you surround yourself with. And it's by the choices you make. Last thing, relationships of trust. Verse 15, the second part of verse 15, the same verse we just read, but I just want to focus on this one part where, where she said, if I'm, I'm faithful, then come to my house and stay. And she prevailed on us. Come to my house and stay. When you invite people into your home, that's pretty personal. I, I, I've actually spoken with people even in our church when I've asked them, they say, would you be willing to host a small group in your, in your home? And be like, no, 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 I don't, I don't have people over my house, or I don't want to have people in my house. Okay, all right. And they have their reasons. But to get personal, you invite people into your house. To go deep, you invite people into your house. Relationships, of, take this, this I'm, I'm going to just give this, this quick thing about um, relationships of trust. 
There's two things that go together. Relationships of trust, environments of grace. Relationships of trust, environments of grace. They go together. If you have a life of, with people that you have uh, relationships of trust with, and if you have a life where you have environments of grace, environments of grace are not in abundance. There aren't many of these places. They're fostered over time. And, and, and my hope, my desire, my prayer is that victory, victory would be an environment of grace where, where, where people are, are not looked down for their choices, but people are embraced and, and restored in the midst of their bad choices, where, where people don't have to be concerned about coming and what, what, that people are going to judge them for all the wrong things they did, but instead people are going to embrace them and restore them. And, and, and that's the church is meant to be a hospital for sinners. It's not where we're all cleaned up because I'm telling you, I'm the chief of sinners. I'm not all cleaned up. I'm not all put together. I've got a long way to go. God is working on me. I'm, thank God I'm not where I was, but I know I'm not where I need to be and not where I can be in the name of Jesus. I don't know if any of you are like that, but that's my starting place. That's my starting place. There are very few places where you can be real, where no one pushes you to put on a mask. We wear masks to hide shame, guilt, and fear. A fake smile covers up a multitude of sins. And then there's that one word, that one word that seals the deal every time we want to cover up. Every time we want to stop from going deeper, there's that one word that we all use so well in response to the, the magic question. How are you doing? Fine, fine. I'm fine, fine. Oh, good, you're fine. Great. Really, I'm broken. Really, I'm sad. Really. I'm scared. Really, I failed. Is it okay to fail? Can I be embraced by God's people if I'm a failure? Can I be embraced by God's people if I lied? If I cheated? If I stole? If I have addictions? If I do the wrong things? Can I be embraced by God's people? We need to be a place where people can be embraced and, and, and restored and lifted up. We are, the church is an environment of grace. The church is where you build relationships of trust, but relationships of trust are not built in a five-minute conversation on the back end of the service. Relationships of trust are built over unhurried time. Unhurried time, just being together. If we're not making space for that, we're not building trust with anybody. The people we're building trust with are the people we're unhurried with. And we all need that community. I pray that that community would be in the church. So open hearts to God, open hearts to others to trust them with who you are. I want to close out this message by just saying that God's people, our response to God says everything. As we open up society, begin by asking the question, do I trust God with my most valuable possession? Do I trust other people with my most valuable possession? Your most valuable possession is you, your heart. And, and so trusting God and others with you is the most beautiful thing that you can do. And it's the most healthy spiritually and emotionally thing you can do. And I want to just lead us to a time of response. Will you join me in prayer? Someone out there might need to trust God for the first time today. Someone out there, whether you're, you're here live or you're watching this afterwards or live, but this may be your time where you need to respond to God by saying, yes, Jesus, I give you my life. And I just want to invite you to do that right now. I want you to say to yourself, either out loud or in the quietness of your heart, say to Jesus, yes, Jesus, I give you my life. 
Jesus, I give you my life. I want you to lead me and guide me and be my Lord. Amen. God bless you. Worship with us right now. Thanks for that message, uh, Dad. That um, some that really, uh, really touched my heart uh, was when he was talking about uh, our emotional needs being met. Um, I'm his son, so we kind of have a lot in common. I don't respond very well to criticism. If you tell me that I'm doing something wrong my anger will immediately flare up. And that's something that I struggle with crazy. And uh, when I'm at my best, I'm able to grow from someone else's criticism. And we need to not be like the world, where the world is so easily offended by every little thing. Willing to cut people off over such small things. We need to not be offended, not let ourselves be offended. And that takes strength to not be offended. And it's not easy. Like you said, it's hard. But that's the way we need to go. Someone does something that you don't like, someone says something that you don't like, check yourself. Don't check them. Check yourself first and then go in love. That's what Jesus would do, and we're called to follow him. So I'd like to invite you to rise as we sing, I will follow. Where you go, I'll go Where you stay, I'll stay When you move, I'll move I will follow Sing it, church All your ways are good All your ways are sure I will trust in you alone Higher than my side, high above my life. I will trust in you alone. Where you go, I go. Where you stay, I stay. When you move, I move. I will follow you. Who you love, I love. How you serve, I serve. If this life I lose. I will follow you, yeah. I will follow you, yeah. Sing it, light. Light into the world, light into my life. I will live for you alone. You're the one I seek, knowing I will find all I need in you alone in you alone sing it where you go i'll go where you stay i'll stay when you move i'll move i will follow you who you love i love how you serve i'll serve if this life i lose i will follow you yeah i'll follow you yeah everlasting in you there's freedom for my soul in you there's joy unending joy and I will follow where you go I'll go where you stay I'll stay when you move I'll move I will follow you who you love I love how you serve, I'll serve. If this life I lose, I will follow you. Yeah, I will follow you. Yeah, sing it again. Where you go? Where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. When you move, I'll move. I will follow you. Who you love, I love. 
how you serve, I'll serve. If this life I lose, I'll follow you. Yeah, I'll follow you. Yeah, I'll follow you. Yeah, I'll follow you. Yeah, amen. That was great, guys. Thank you for that song. Such an appropriate song to, on the back end of that message, to trusting Jesus, following him wherever he leads. That's the kind of life that we're meant to live, an all-in way, not a part way. You can't just apply, apply Christianity to little parts of your life. You've got to go to the whole enchilada. Amen. God bless you as you, as you um, go today. Um, I just want to say, if, if any of you, if anybody put their faith in Jesus, please let us know so we can support you, encourage you, and put some resources in your hand. Let us know by sending us an email to info at victoryanaheim.org. And it's the beginning of a journey. It's the beginning of life with God like never before. And so I, as, as we go, I want to send you out remembering this, that um, your heart is yours. Your heart, you control who you let into your heart. You allow those who you want to come into your lives, and you keep out those that you don't want into your lives. But I want to encourage you, as society begins to open up, um, the date is June 15th that, that California officially opens up. Um, and, and as we move toward that day, this series ends three days before that. And as we, as we um, move toward that day, I want to encourage you about trusting God with other, and others with your heart. Um, and that's the most beautiful thing you can do. And let the right people into your life. And, and, and let God into your life. And go in peace in the, in the name of Jesus with an open heart. And so um, they're going to lead us in one last song. Join us. Let's do it. Put your hands together. Every nation, people from every nation in 